In the early hours of January 18, 1960, tragedy struck in the skies over Virginia. Capital Airlines Flight 20, a Vickers Viscount aircraft, tragically crashed, taking the lives of all 50 people on board. The wreckage, found in a ravine, presented a puzzling scene. Trees pierced the aircraft from below, yet they stood upright, indicating the plane might have plummeted straight down. Despite this, there was no clear evidence of engine failure, with no black boxes on board and no survivors. Investigators faced the challenge of deciphering the accident from limited and perplexing clues. Their determination to uncover the truth led to significant changes in the certification of turbine-powered aircraft. This crash marked a poignant moment in aviation history, occurring during a period of rapid growth for American air travel in the 1940s and 1950s. Capital Airlines, once a major player and the fifth largest in the U.S., was known for innovations like the fold-down tray table and economy tickets. But despite its contributions, the airline ceased operations by the end of 1961, a forgotten pioneer in an evolving industry. Capital Airlines became big and then disappeared because of a special plane, the Vickers Viscount. It was made in the UK by Vickers Armstrongs in the 1940s. It was a big plane with four propellers that changed how people flew around the world. The Viscount was the first plane to have turboprop engines, which use a turbine, like a jet engine, to make the propellers spin. Before that, all planes had piston engines, like cars. But piston engines were noisy, wasteful, and broke down a lot. Turboprop engines were quieter, faster, and more reliable. They only needed to spin very fast to make the propellers spin with less parts. The turboprop engines had a big hole that sicked in air, and made it tight in a compressor. Then the air went into a chamber where it was mixed with fuel and set on fire, making it bigger. A bigger air pushed through a turbine, making it spin. The turbine was connected to the propellers by a shaft and a gearbox, which made them spin too. The propellers pushed the plane forward. They were better than jet engines, which pushed the plane with the air coming out of the turbine. Jet engines were not good for low and slow flights, but turboprop engines were. That's why the Viscount was good for short flights between cities. The Vickers Viscount was a special plane that started flying in 1953. It was the first plane with propellers that used turbines, like jet engines, to make them spin. It was the second plane with turbines, after another plane that crashed a lot. But the Viscount was very good and they made almost 450 of them in 10 years. The airlines liked the Viscount because it was cheap and easy to fix, and the passengers liked it because it was quiet and nice. It was also faster than other planes. In 1955, Capital Airlines bought a lot of Viscounts to be the first US airline with turbine planes. They ordered more than 60 Viscounts, and maybe more later, but they didn't get all of them. The Viscount was very popular in America, and the wife of the vice president broke a bottle of wine on the first one to fly. But Capital Airlines had a problem. They spent too much money on the Viscounts, and they couldn't pay for them. And the Viscounts started to crash a lot. In 1958, a Viscount crashed in Michigan because of ice on the tail. Then another Viscount crashed in Maryland because it hit another plane. And in 1959, a Viscount broke apart in the air because of a storm near Maryland. And on the same day, another Capital Airlines plane ran off the runway in West Virginia. Many people died in these crashes. This was very bad for Capital Airlines and a Viscount. On a dark night in 1960, a Viscount plane crashed in Virginia and killed 50 people. It was Capital Airlines Flight 20, flying from Chicago to Norfolk with a stop in Washington. There were 46 passengers and four crew on the plane. The pilot was very good and had flown a lot, especially on the Viscount. The co-pilot was also good and had flown a lot on the Viscount. The Viscount was the first plane with propellers that used turbines, like jet engines, to make them spin. The pilots knew how to fly this plane well. Before they left Washington, the pilots got a weather report from the company. The report said the weather was bad in Virginia. There were low clouds and fog, and it was hard to see. It was also cold and icy in the clouds.
The report said the ice could be bad for the plane. After they took off, the plane went up to 5,000 feet over Springfield, Virginia. Then the air traffic control told them to go up to 8,000 feet. The plane was supposed to fly over some places called Brook, Tappahannock, and Hopewell, and then go to Norfolk. The pilots told the air traffic control where they were over Brook and Tappahannock. Then the air traffic control told them to talk to Norfolk over Hopewell at 8,000 feet. The pilot said okay at 2205. That was the last time anyone heard from Flight 20. Soon after, near Holdcroft, between Richmond and Norfolk, people heard a plane flying low and making big circles in the clouds and fog. The engines sounded wrong. They made noises like popping, and they stopped and started at least three times. At 2219, the engines made a loud noise, and then it was quiet. A farmer named Robert Tench lived very close to where the plane crashed. He saw smoke and fire near his house, but it took him 30 minutes to find the plane in a wet ditch on his land, near a river between Holdcroft and Bins Hall. Some other people got there before the helpers, and they saw the plane on fire, lying on the ground among the trees. They saw some bodies in the plane, but they knew no one was alive. It was hard to get to the plane with big machines, and the fire burned for 10 hours until there was nothing left. Only the tail, the nose, the wings, and some burned pieces were left. But what was strange was that the plane did not break any trees, except the ones under it. Two trees went through the wings from below, and one went through the tail, and they were still standing. It looked like the plane was dropped on the trees from above. Anyone could see that the plane was not moving forward when it hit the ground. But why did that happen? And what did the weird noises and circles have to do with the crash? Flight 20 was the worst crash for Capital Airlines and for Virginia. Many important people from Norfolk died, like bankers, lawyers, and soldiers. The people near the crash site were very shocked. The farmer, Robert Tench, said the next day, that's too many people to die on one man's land. But the Civil Aeronautics Board, CAP, the government agency that looked into plane crashes, had to find out what happened. They didn't have much to help them. The plane didn't have any black boxes to record what happened, because only jet planes had them then. And the people who saw the start of the problem were all dead, and the fog was too thick for anyone on the ground to see the plane at the end. The cab had one clue, where the plane crashed. It was far away from the path it should have followed. That meant the plane didn't crash suddenly, but had a problem for some time. That matched what people heard. The plane made circles before it crashed, but the pilots didn't call for help, so they must have been very busy with the problem. The investigators looked at the engines first, because people heard strange noises from them. Sometimes people hear wrong, but this time they were right. Two engines on the right wing were working when the plane crashed, but two engines on the left wing were not. The propellers on the left wing were in the feathered position. The propellers pushed the plane forward by cutting the air with their blades. The blades can change their angle to push more or less air. When the angle is zero, the blades are flat and don't push any air. When the angle is bigger, the blades push more air until they reach a point where they push less air. The biggest angle is the feathered position where the blades are sideways and face the air. On the Viscount, the feathered angle was 84 degrees. The propellers should be feathered when the engines stop working in the air. When the engines stop, the air makes the propellers spin backwards. This slows down the plane a lot, but this can be stopped by feathering the propellers so the air doesn't make them spin. You can see a Viscount propeller stop spinning when it is feathered. When an engine stops working during flight, the pilot must quickly turn the propeller blades so that they face the wind and create less drag. This is called feathering the propeller. Most planes have a system that does this automatically when an engine fails. On a Viscount, this system would sense when an engine was not producing enough power and feather the propeller of that engine. Sometimes, the pilot might need to feather or unfeather the propeller manually. There were two ways to do this on the Viscount. One way was to use a lever that cut off the fuel and opened a valve that let oil move a piston that changed the angle of the blades. The other way was to use a button that turned on a pump that did the same thing with electricity. 
The pilot could also restart the engine by unfeathering the propeller manually. There were two ways to do this as well. One way was to pull the button that reversed the pump and turned on the sparks that ignited the fuel. The other way was to let the wind spin the propeller fast enough to move the piston and the sparks without electricity. To unfeather the propeller and restart the engine, the pilot had to close the fuel valve and reduce the power. This was because the system would still think the engine was failing if the power was high. Investigators looked at the plane's remains and saw that the fuel valves on engines 1 and 2 were open. This meant that the system had feathered these propellers by itself. But when they checked the engines, they found no damage or problems that could have made them stop working. The plane should have been able to fly with two engines and two feathered propellers. So what made Flight 20 crash? Investigators thought of three possible reasons. Not enough fuel, bad fuel, or ice in the engines. They ruled out the first two because there was enough fuel and it was clean. That left ice as the most likely reason. Sometimes ice can make the engines lose power for a short time. They can be restarted, but the system would fever the propellers anyway. Ice would affect all the engines the same way. So maybe all four engines stopped working at some point. That would explain why Flight 20 could not stay in the air. Maybe the pilots restarted some engines later, but it was too late to avoid the crash. The weather also supported this idea. There was ice in the clouds, and it was very cold at the plane's altitude. The data showed that enough ice could have formed on the engine openings in the minutes before the crash. Tests showed that this amount of ice could make the engine stop working if it went inside them. The Viscount had a system that could heat up the engine openings and melt any ice that might block them. The pilot had to turn on this system when it was cold and wet outside. If the pilot turned it on too late, the ice could fall off in big pieces and make the engine stop working. Investigators wanted to know if the pilot of Flight 20 turned on this system on time. They found out that the instructions for using this system were confusing and different. The maker of the plane had changed the instructions in 1958, but the airline did not tell its pilots about the change. Most of the pilots did not know when to turn on the system. Some of them also looked at the ice on the window wipers instead of the wetness in the air. This was risky, because the ice on the window wipers might not show up until there was too much ice on the engine openings. There was another crash in Denmark in 1957, where Viscount lost three engines because of ice. The pilots landed safely in a field, but the plane was destroyed. The pilots said they turned on the heating system to melt the ice. But investigators thought maybe the system had a power problem that made it stop working for a while. When it started working again, it could have made the ice fall off and stop the engines. There was no proof for this, but investigators did not want to say the pilots were wrong. Today, they might say they don't know why the ice got into the engines. This crash showed how dangerous it was to turn on the heating system too late. There were also eight other times when Viscounts lost two or more engines because of ice. The maker of the plane knew about this and changed the instructions for the pilots. The new instructions said that if there was ice before the heating system was on, the pilots should turn it on for two engines first, then the other two. That way, if the ice fell off, it would only stop two engines, not all four. The old instructions said that the pilot had to go down to a warmer place before trying to start the engines again. But this was not true, because the engines could start again at any temperature. Also, going down meant less power on the other engines, which made them more likely to stop working too. So the new instructions said that the pilot could start the engines again without going down. But the pilots of Flight 20 did not know about the new instructions, because the airline did not tell them. We don't know why they turned on the heating system too late, but maybe they did not see the ice or did not check the temperature. When they turned on the heating system, they did it for all four engines at the same time. If there was too much ice on all four engines, then they could all stop working very fast. When the engine stopped working, the propellers turned to face the wind by themselves, and the plane started to fall. In other times when Viscounts lost engines because of ice, the pilots could start them again easily. They just had to lower the power, press the button, and wait for the engine to start. 
This should take only a few seconds. But if all four engines stopped working, then starting the first one would be harder. This was because the button needed electricity, and there was less electricity when all the engines were off. The plane had generators that made electricity from the engines. If the engines were too slow, the generators would not work. A stopped engine could still make electricity if the propeller was spinning fast enough, but a feathered propeller would not spin much. So if all four engines stopped and feathered, the plane would have no electricity. It would only have a battery. The investigators tested the plane and found out that the battery would run out of power very quickly at night. Then the pilots could not unfeather the propellers by pressing the buttons. The pilots had a switch that could save some power by turning off some things that were not important, like the lights. Then the battery would last longer, but the pilots had to use the switch very fast, or it would be too late. The plane had no other way to make power. The pilots also had a checklist that told them what to do when the engine stopped. The checklist said that they had to go down to a warmer place before trying to start the engines again. But this was wrong and it wasted time and power. The engines could start again at any place. Modern planes have better checklists for this, but not in 1960. The investigators thought that this was why the pilots could not start engines one and two right away. But how did the plane go from falling slowly with no engines to falling fast with two engines? The plane had no power, so the buttons to unfeather the propellers did not work. The only way to unfeather the propellers was to make them spin fast enough with the wind. But this was hard, because the propellers did not want to spin when they were feathered. The plane had to go very fast to make them spin. The only way to go very fast was to dive. When the plane was fast enough, the oil pumps in the engines would work, and the oil would push the propellers out of feather. Then the propellers would spin faster and make power again. The pilots could then try to start the engines. This was a lot to do while diving from a low height. The pilots had to do this twice, because the plane could not fly with one engine. The investigators thought that the pilots started engine for this way, but the plane was falling fast. The pilots gave full power to engine four to slow down, but this made the plane turn left in a big circle. Tests showed that the plane would do this even if the pilots tried to turn right. This was why people on the ground heard the plane circling before it crashed. With engine 4 running, the pilots had power to start the other engines normally, but the plane was falling fast, and they did not have much time. They started engine 3, but this made the plane harder to control. The plane was losing speed as the pilots tried to stay above the ground. They had only two working engines on one side, and two broken engines on the other side. This made it hard to control the plane. If they gave more power to the working engines, they could lose control and flip over. This is called a VMC roll, and it usually kills everyone on board. But the plane did not flip over. It crashed with the nose and wings level. The investigators thought that the pilots knew about the VMC roll danger. They turned down the power on the working engines to avoid it. They hoped to restart the broken engines and fly away safely. The investigators found that the working engines were at low power when the plane hit the ground. This supported their idea. The pilots had no other reason to do this unless they were afraid of the VMC roll. Some witnesses heard loud bangs from the plane. The investigators thought this was because of extra fuel in the engines. When the pilots tried to restart the engines, the fuel exploded. This made a lot of noise but did not hurt the engines. The plane came out of the clouds very low. The pilots knew they were going to crash. They might have pulled up hard to avoid the ground, but then the plane stalled. It had no power to go up. The plane spun and fell flat on the trees. The pilots gave more power to the engines just before they hit the ground, but it was too late. Everyone died. The investigators guessed what happened based on the evidence. They did not have a recording of the pilots' voices. Maybe the pilots made some mistakes, but that was not the main reason for the crash. Even if they did everything right, they still could have crashed in that dark valley. The crash was partly because of Capital Airlines. They did not update their checklists for the pilots. The checklists had some problems that could cause a crash. But the bigger problem was with the plane itself. 
It was made by Vickers Armstrongs and approved by the UK and the US. The plane had a system that could stop all the propellers at once if something went wrong with the engines. This was supposed to be a safety feature, but it was not. It made the plane lose all its power and control. This is probably what happened to Capital Airlines Flight 20. The US rules said that one bad engine should not affect the other engines. Some people thought this meant that the propellers should not stop all at once if something went wrong with the engines. One way to do this is to make a system that can only stop one propeller at a time. Then, if all the engines lose power, only one propeller will stop. The other engines will come back, or the pilots can stop the other propellers themselves. If the Viscount had this system, the crash of Flight 20 might not have happened. The Viscount was first checked by the British Air Board. They had a similar rule, but they did not notice this problem. The plane was then allowed to fly in the U.S. without another check. This was because the U.S. Air Authority trusted the British Air Board. They still do this today, but they are more careful. Now, there is a rule that says how many propellers can stop at once. The crash of Flight 20 made people aware of these problems, but Capital Airlines did not last long enough to fix them. In May 1960, they could not pay for their Viscount planes, and Vickers Armstrongs took them back. The next year, Capital Airlines was sold to United and disappeared.